This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Hey, new filmmakers, I'm Nick Bodmer. I'm Griffin Hammond, and today I have several items I would like to sell. I'm doing a YouTube garage sale. I got mics, I got lenses, all sorts of things I don't need anymore, and I'd love to give them a new home, maybe yours. <laughs> maybe mine, maybe I'll buy them from you. <laughs> yeah, maybe I could just send some stuff to you. Beautiful. All right. Well, what are we selling? I'm I'm excited. I kind of I looked around to see if I could uh, throw anything into the garage sale, and uh, you know I'm do, I've done pretty good at cleaning up the tech. So nothing for me. It's all you today, Griffin. Yeah, this is something we've done or I've done kind of regularly. Uh, I think my first one was June of 2014, right before I moved to New York. I sold a bunch of stuff through YouTube. I did it again in 2018. I think you and I both sold some stuff that time. And I'm not trying to exploit our audience. I just think that it's good for filmmakers to every once in a while assess the equipment they're using and, and offload the equipment they're not using. And it's silly for me to hold on to the stuff when I'm not using it. So I'd love to, to give it a new home. And also, I don't want to pay 9% to eBay or whatever the, the fee is. We're going to pass the savings on to you. Right, yeah. I like to think that my prices are, are fair and everything is going to include free shipping in the U.S. So uh, we'll talk through these things. But also, if you're not interested in buying anything, hopefully you just, it's interesting to hear us talk about the equipment that we've used and why we're not using it anymore. Yep, sounds good. All right, what's up first? So I think I'm just going to go in like price order. We're going to go uh, from the cheapest to the most expensive. And all of this stuff, you can just go right to griffinhammond.com slash sale or just go to our show notes at hey.film if you're interested in anything. The way it works is you just answer a few questions, say the thing you're interested in, and then we'll get back to you and let you know if you're the, it's not like an auction, but uh, we'll just, we'll prioritize the people who answer first. So let's see, I have a $20 item here. This is a Tech, the gimbal company, you know Tech. Yep. They make several accessories for their gimbals, and this is a little monopod. It's actually a very slim or short monopod, and it comes with a little bag that actually has a little belt clip on it, and it has a little belt clip that can hook on the bottom of the gimbal, or not the gimbal, the monopod. Um, I'm thinking of gimbal because you could also throw this on the bottom of an existing gimbal, anything that has a tripod mount on the bottom. I think that's kind of the idea here why they made this so short. You can hook this onto your belt and then you always have like support for the the gimbal. Oh, that's clever. Yeah, and it gets, it's not like the longest monopod in the world. I guess, yeah, it's only like two and a half or three feet tall. I think the idea is that you would put a gimbal on top of it. Um, what are you using for a gimbal these days? Are you still using those Yuntech? Yeah, I'm using their... Uh, their Weeble Lab. Got it. Which is a weird name, um, but yeah, I've had, had that for a few years. And I'm just not someone who uses monopods, and I don't use a monopod on my gimbal. So this has just never been used and just kind of going to waste here. So 20, 20 bucks if you need like need like a half-size monopod okay. with a cute little bag. Griffin, tell us what we have next. A microphone. In fact, I think I have it hooked up right now. Let's see. Testing. Oh, here it is, yeah. Uh, it's a stick microphone. It's this uh, Sennheiser E816S. I'm selling this for $45. Uh, this is a microphone. It's just a stick mic that I've had for like, I don't know. Maybe I've had this for 15 years. Can you tell how old this model is? I'm looking right now. It looks like kind of Sennheiser's version of the SM58 or something like that. Kind of their super cardioid handheld vocal mic. Uh, yeah, it's got. I mean, it's I've got seen a nice... that thing around you for a long time. So yeah, I, I've definitely seen it before. And it looks like forty-five dollars, pretty good deal because they're going for more than that on eBay. Yeah, I mean, it seems like a substantial mic. I think it's good. I'm, I mean, you're hearing it right now. This is the mic that I'm. I'm you're hearing right now in the audio feed. Uh, I've just, I've kept this for a long time because I keep thinking I need a wired stick mic and I just never use never it. Never like use I have, it. <laughs> I have a couple wireless Sennheiser mics and generally I'm using shotgun mics or, or, you know, I'm just, I'm not a stick mic guy. I don't usually like to see it in the shot. So it is right. complete waste for me to hold on to this thing. Anyone out there need a $45 stick mic? Here you go. Boom. 
made in Germany. Okay, we'll go back to my blue baby bottle microphone now. Which is uh, not for sale. That's critical no, podcast no. infrastructure. We need it. That's right. <laughs> my next item is actually my Apple Watch. I just upgraded to an Apple Watch. What is this one called? That I have the SE? Apple Watch SE. Yes, indeed. Which is really the Series 5 that they renamed. Um, I have a Series 3 here that I am no longer using. It's the 38 millimeter, so it's a smaller size. It's a cellular plus GPS model, so it has a little red uh, crown button. It certainly doesn't have the same amount of battery life that it did when I first got it, but it still lasts at least a day. I charge it. I was charging it every day. Um, I just, it's a slower processor than the current versions, and it was not doing some of the running things that I wanted to do exactly the way I wanted to do it. So I'm offloading this Apple Watch Series 3 for $90 if anyone is interested. I'd like to be able to sell my old Apple Watches, but unfortunately they have a tendency to get shattered like this one here. This is an Apple Watch Series 4, I believe, with a shattered screen. Mm. Uh, and the cost to repair the shattered screen is more than buying a replacement. So it sits yeah. forlorn on my desk. <laughs> Very sad. It does have, you know, little cosmetic scratches on the sides. This is the aluminum space gray model. Um, I actually never even noticed the scratches on the side because you never really look at them. It does have a little tiny scratch on the glass way on the left side. Like, it's not in the way of anything. I do notice it a little bit when it's turned off. When the screen's on, I don't even really see the, the scratch. Um, but, yeah, if you're interested, let me know. I love my Apple Watch. If you don't have one, they're very nice. Yeah, and I think I bought it for, like... 250 or something in like a Black Friday deal a few years ago. Yeah. The fourth item I'm selling today, this is actually, what I think, one of the most interesting items I'm selling. It's a lens for my, well, it's a micro four thirds lens. It's that 14 millimeter pancake lens. Oh, very small, right? That little tiny lens. Uh, it's, a, it's a 14 millimeter f2.5. It's a lens that I've kept, I've been I've been holding on to for years. I, I mean, it's probably one of my oldest lenses. I've probably had it for, I don't know, 15 years or something. When did we first get our, like, GH1? Oh, geez, that would have been, like, 2013 or something, maybe? 2014? It was, no, it was before that. I, I feel like it was, like, 2010 10? we were buying. Yeah, maybe. Jeez. Uh, so we're maybe old. this is 11 years old. Maybe it's not 15. That's, that's an overstatement. Yeah. Um, I'm sure I used this at some weddings. You always had the 20 millimeter, which you really liked. Yep. It's like another thin pancake lens. This is a lens that I used to use a lot. I really don't use anymore. Uh, and I keep holding onto it because I keep thinking, well, it's my smallest lens. It's only 1.8 ounces. And if I ever need just like a tiny lens for maybe I want to mount my camera on a bike or something or like... I keep thinking I'll give Peter one of these cameras and I'll just give him the tiniest lens, but I just don't ever use it. Uh, I keep thinking I'm going to need a tiny lens and I just really don't. So it's sitting here doing nothing. $110. Yeah. $110 has the rear cap lens cap. I have a little lens bag. I keep all my little Lumix lens bags. So I'll send that, send it to you in that. Oh, I, I, I should also mention one thing I like about this lens. And maybe this is just a characteristic of all tiny pancake type lenses is it seems like it can focus really close. Yeah. Mm, okay. I don't know. I just assume it has something to do with the optics of like this because it's so small, it can focus really close. I would say like, I physics are involved if that's what you're yeah. saying. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm, I think right I'm, now I'm probably so. seven inches away from my face and I can get pretty nice focus. Nice. So I, I always found I could use this lens for close-up shots on, on things to get some detail. All right. You ready for item number five? I'm not, but let's do it. <laughs> We're going up in price uh, slowly. This is a, a uh, $150 mic that I'm selling. It's a Deity V-Mic D3 Pro. It comes with... 
little case. And the interesting thing about this mic is that it's a little shotgun mic, has a has a little deity uh, windscreen on it. And it's it's kind of a combo mic that's designed for use on top of your camera or with an XLR uh, recorder because it has it has a an eighth inch output like a headphone jack so you can plug it directly into your camera but it also comes with this little adapter that I've never seen one like this it's just a little XLR adapter with a with a eighth inch on the other side pretty compact yeah. interesting yeah, so here, let me plug it right in to my recorder. Let's see if this works. Oh, and it's a powered mic, it, but instead of having like a double A or something, you hold down this button to turn it on. There's a little green LED light that turns on. Um, it's actually has an internal battery and you charge it through USB-C. So it has a little USB-C port on the side. And then this mic also has a little gain dial on the back. So let's see right now if you can hear me. Oh, I'm too hot. Let's turn it down. Testing, testing, testing. Okay, so now you're hearing me on the Deity V mic D3 D3 Pro. Pro. And I will say, I think I, I tested this mic out and thought, eh, I it wasn't I wasn't super impressed by the quality. I guess you can hear it right now and, and tell me what you think. Um, but that's why I've just never chosen it uh, compared to some of my other mics. Like you know, Griffin, as a salesperson <laughs> in my day job. Telling people why something isn't very good is not the best way to sell something. Just no, just putting it out I there. I just disagree. I disagree. Uh, you, you're still hearing the the Deity V Mic Pro right now. I think that by being honest, uh, you ha you have a lot more credibility. And Interesting. Be honest in sales. Okay, I might give that a try. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Actually, I mean, it's something I like when I do like trade show events for Panasonic, and I think Panasonic appreciates this too. That I'll get up on stage and say, "These are the things I love about this camera," and there's this other thing that I don't that bothers me, and yeah. I think it just tells the audience, like, "Oh, the, this person's not being a salesperson; they're they're actually just having telling me their honest experience with this equipment." Um, honest. I mean, you may okay, hmm. you may love the sound of this mic, and you may think I need a mic that can do both things, and I need a mic with internal battery so I don't have to run phantom power. These are all just things I don't need because I'm always going into my audio recorder and always have phantom power pretty much. So And you're you're spending a lot more than $150 on the mics you use daily. Yeah, but not a lot more. Like the mic that I choose is Dude, this one I'm here. Setting the you up to kind of build this product <laughs> up and no, just won't, won't take the bait. I, uh, I, I really like the Asden 250CX. If you're going to spend $200 on a microphone, I think this is a great choice. Uh, yeah. But it doesn't have a built-in battery, so it needs phantom power all the time. Okay. Um, and it doesn't come with a cool case like the Deity V Mic. The Deity V Mic D3 Pro comes with. Okay, I'm going to switch back to my blue baby bottle now. All right, I'm excited about this next one. You tried to sell this to me, and I almost took you up on it, but then I decided to spend more money, as I usually Yeah, in do. our last... In our last episode, we talked about how I have upgraded my projector for my new basement space that we're building right now, or renovating right now. And you decided you wanted to do some outdoor movie watching in your backyard. Yep. And you told me you were going to get a new projector, and I was like, you should just buy my old projector that I need to get rid of now. <laughs> yeah. And I just, because I'm shooting outdoor or uh, not shooting uh projecting outdoors i wanted to get as many lumens as i could so i went a slightly different direction but yeah i actually thought the opposite that you because you were going to be outside in the dark of night that you wouldn't need a very bright one but i guess you have your the hope is to be able to turn it on as soon as possible so with the right. one i purchased that's over three thousand lumens like the sun, like I can still see the sun in the sky and I can, I can at least make out an image, right? So, you know, like we were watching sports, right? The sports game might go on long into the evening, but it might start a little early and it's nice to at least see what's going on, even might, though it might not look great, right? Yeah. So that was the idea. Yeah. Well, yeah. And my, my new projector that I bought is a, uh, what is it? An Epson? Yeah. The Epson 5040 UB. It's a 2,500 lumen projector, I believe. Mm -hmm. And it's replacing the one I'm selling today, 
which is this Optima HD20 uh, projector that's only 1700 lumens. So, I mean, it's been plenty bright for everything I've needed it for, but I, I think I want a brighter projector, which is primarily the reason I upgraded. Uh, this is also a 1080 projector. The one I have now is kind of a faux 4K. It's um, basically 4K. You don't have to worry about that too much. Yeah. Um, but I will say an HD projector, I mean, I was getting by just fine on this. I really upgraded because I thought I might want a little bit more brightness in my bigger what, space. What I'm excited about with this Optoma HD20 is all the accessories <laughs> you're including. Can you tell me a little bit about those accessories, Griffin? Oh, yeah. Well, it comes with the light-up remote, Ooh. which is lighting up blue right now. Now, are there batteries in that remote? There are. You can have and them. And those are included? <laughs> sure. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, I, should, I should mention the price on this. Uh, I'm selling this projector for $199. Gets you, like Nick said, several accessories. You have the remote. Well, you have everything you need. You have the remote. You have even the... Um, the, the projector mount. I actually got a new mount because my new projector is so much bigger than this one. That's yeah, one I should have warned you one. about can, that. Sorry. I can hold this for the podcast. The other one I would be struggling, I think, with one hand. <laughs> it's a big projector. Um, so I needed a bigger mount. But this one has a nice low profile, relatively low profile white mount actually attached right now. You can see it. Um, and I also have like a 50-foot white HDMI cable and a 15-foot white AC cable if you want to run that along your wall or something. All like, color I'm matched. Just... Fantastic. Even if you don't need them, I'll just throw them in because uh, I don't I don't need them. Well, unless you just want to tell me not to put them in the box. Uh, I checked the, the menu to see how many hours I put on this thing because I see a lot of people selling projectors like this. I mean, I bought this in 2014, so it's seven years old. Yep. And it... I just assumed it would have like 5,000 hours on it because that's what it seems like a lot of people have when they're selling. And I looked, and I only have 1,500 hours on the bulb. Oh, it's a lot of life left in that bulb. Yeah, because I think my understanding was like you could probably get like 20,000 hours out of a bulb. Is that right? I, it just depends. I honestly don't know off the top yeah. of my head. I mean, for all I know, I could ship this to you and the bulb could break or something. I don't know. But <laughs> hopefully that doesn't happen. But uh, 199, you get the projector, you get the remote with batteries, 50 foot HDMI <laughs> cable, 15 foot AC cable, and the ceiling mount. Do I have that right? Yeah, I think that's a great deal because I, I think I spent 550 on this projector. I mean, I think it retailed for 700, and I I bought it like open box. Um, if you've never watched any ago. of your own work on a large screen, it's really quite fun. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. Well, and this was like, I mean, we didn't own a TV in New York. So the entire time we lived in New York, we just had this on the, the ceiling of our apartment. But I guess we actually didn't watch all that much because I did the math and it looks like 1500 hours is we watched it about four hours a week for seven years, which sounds like our life. Like we would turn it on a few nights a week to watch one show and then we'd go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> I think we watched like all of Game of Thrones. This projector pretty much just watched Game of Thrones and some other stuff. How many times has it watched Sriracha, you think? Probably, yeah, a few times, yeah. Maybe You'd hope. Maybe six You'd times, hope. I don't know. All right, so we're down uh, to one item left. This is, yeah. this is the exciting one, folks. Get ready. This is our, our priciest item. I am selling a Rode NTG3 microphone for $480. Okay. Which does seem like it's a little bit less than, than some of the ones I've seen on, on eBay. I think I've seen this sell for as high as like five fifty. Um still got the box. I like to hold on to boxes if the item is this expensive. Here's everything that this this mic comes with. It has a fancy little road bag, leather bag inside the box. What I like about this NTG three it's the satin nickel one, so it's my only like silvery microphone. But uh, it comes with the the mic stand and the 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 windscreen, of course. But if you want, when you travel with this thing, this is the only mic I've ever seen that did this. This mic comes with this like heavy duty. I don't know if it's aluminum or what this tube is made out of. It comes with this big metal tube. Looks like a pipe bomb. <laughs> 
Doesn't seem good. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's just it's just this little it's this heavy duty metal tube with two screw metal knobs on the end, so you can completely lock up this. this oh, it's mic. just like a protective housing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I see. I was confused. Yeah. So if you are someone who really bashes around your microphones, you might like a microphone that has this super protective housing. Um, and I will say, you know, again, I'm not going to be a great salesperson for this because over the years, the reason I find myself not using this mic is it sounds great. It's always been my best sounding mic. But when I do side-by-side -side tests, I can't really hear the difference between my $200 Asden 250CX and this, this thing. I mean, I think new... This mic retails for like 700 or 800. Um, so it's a great mic, but I have other great mics and I just find myself sticking to the smaller one because uh, the Asden is much smaller. But I suppose if you need a great mic that is a little bit longer, maybe looks a little bit more professional, has a great way to protect it in transit, this might be the one for you. How'd I do on that one, Nick? That that was better. I was about to say, yeah. That, <laughs> that now we're getting like infomercially, which I like. Yeah. <laughs> the Rode NTG3 could be yours for just four hundred and eighty dollars. Um, and I will it. say, I, I guess you could you could haggle with me. Uh, although I think traditionally, as I've done these over the years, there's been no need for that because there's generally more than one person that wants each item. But we'll see. Uh, you're, I'll take you're the Rode NTG3 for one dollar. Yeah, you're welcome to click Rode NTG3 and, and then in the comments say, uh, "Actually, I only want it for one dollar." And we'll, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> well, you just remember that Nick wants it for a dollar. See if anybody says uh, anything better. And if nobody does, then you have to give it to me for a dollar. That's the rules. Bye. But yeah, I figure any of the stuff that doesn't sell directly to the audience, I'll just take it to eBay. Um, but uh, I've always had better luck. It's just quicker doing it on YouTube. That's primarily why I've done it over the years because I think my technique for YouTube has always been go on on a Thursday night, set it up as a 10-day auction so it has a long time to be online. It ends on a Sunday, which is like a, a day when people are online and not at work and they can bid at the end. And that's that's always been a way for me to maximize my return on things on eBay. But I don't want to wait 10 days if I don't have to and I don't want to pay... The fees to ebay if there's people right here who want this stuff it's a beautiful thing it's a beautiful thing <laughs> thank Reduce, you for, for reuse, helping recycle. me that's what i clear say. out my home and also you're pretty much helping me pay for my new projector that's my if fault. i can sell all the stuff then then most of it i'll i'll have almost paid off the i think i paid Actually, I think I paid sixteen hundred for the projector. So well, let's find a couple more things, and stuff, we I'll can make... buy you an actual sound system too. Right? Anything? Yeah, yeah. Maybe you're buying me my new sound system. <laughs> <sighs> well, should we take a quick break and then answer some questions? Let's do it. All right. So after the break, we'll answer your questions about ripping DVDs and how to make sure clients pay you. Important things. Handy Filmmakers is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your filmmaking business. So I was just doing a workshop with some students from my alma mater, and the first thing I told them as, as I was speaking to them over Zoom is, hey, while I talk, go ahead and go to griffinhammond.com slash griffin, which is a page on my site that just explains me and my my biography and it was useful because I, I figured they may want to read along as i go or it might help them answer, ask questions um, if, if i forgot something it was right there but i find that i keep using this tool on my website just this about me page is so important it, it's very high on my seo people are always asking for my bio for like a film festival or something and i'll just point them right to griffinhammond.com slash griffin Probably the most important thing about your website is just that it explains your story. And if that's the only page you had on your site, it's it's a valuable one. Check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash griffin to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. 
I feel like one more time I should mention the website where people can go if they wanted to buy any of that stuff. You can you can see it all at griffinhammond.com slash sale or in our show notes at hey.film. Perfect. So we got this email from Tom, and he says, I'm in the process of archiving 30 years of theater production on video. It's a mix of VHS, then Hi8 tapes, DVDs, and SD cards. I figured out how to capture the VHS and Hi8 through a USB capture device in conjunction with OBS software. The trouble I have now is DVDs, which I can play on my PC, but how do I get these into editing software and then to YouTube? What do you think, Griffin? Well, this is so so funny because like I'm amazed that he even has a PC that has a DVD drive. Well, like that makes it a lot easier if you do though. Yeah, I mean that's the problem I've had for years. Is if someone gives me a DVD, there's there's just, I, I can't do anything with it. I don't have a DVD player. I've even looked at the PS4, which I still have, and I don't think it can read like even a music CD, or like. So it's so cheap it, now. I, I have play, an like, external data DVD burner drive in right. a box somewhere. So you know, the one time a year I need it, I can I can fish it out. So I mean, they don't yeah. cost much anymore. So it's not that hard to to go get a, a DVD. I actually play. did that last time. I got a CD. I think I got a data CD from someone, and it it I just I bought like a thirty dollar USB drive. Yeah. Um, to read it but yeah it felt like such a waste because otherwise i don't really need that stuff so you know it's funny is, about tom's uh question here is he the harder ones are the vhs and the i8 and he's already got that uh, right he's taken blown care past of. that part <laughs> yeah got, and the dvd that. stuff is going to be pretty easy i think um what do you think well knowing that it's been so long since i've done this i, I know that i can still make dvds in final cut 10 i actually yep. don't even know if final cut can read them but i assume he was talking about like going into the files and trying to find the files and read them in his in his editing software. But surely you could still use like just ripping software. That's what we would always use for DVDs. Does that stuff still yeah, exist? That exactly. That's what I recommend. So on the Mac there is an app called Make MKV. It's a paid app, though I think it has free trials, and it is great for ripping DVDs and Blu-rays. Uh, so Check that one out, very user-friendly. Or if you're just doing DVDs and not worry about Blu-rays, Handbrake will still rip right off of a DVD and uh, and spit it out. Yeah, um, Handbrake is the so, one I always used. Yeah, over the and that's years. totally yeah. free. Now, if you're is that on PC as well? A, say again? Is that also on PC? It is, yep. yep. Oh, cool. So yeah, there's tons of software to, to, to do this. So uh, definitely check out Handbrake, it's free. Um, and especially since these will not be copy protected DVDs, I'm assuming since they're you know uh, local productions, uh, it'll be super simple. If if they were you know if you're ripping DVDs for your own personal DVD collection or something, you need uh, uh, some some of the components to uh, decode that aren't built in, but you can get them. Um, and then an, another tool I'll just point out is once you have these video files, um, you know if you're trying to archive them in a reasonable quality but still get them nice and small there's a great transcoding tool called other video transcoding it's totally free we'll put a link in the show notes don melton um who's a former apple engineer i think uh keeps these up and so i use those a lot Hmm. when i rip something to uh to shrink the file size down like even if you do like if you rip a blu-ray that can be 20 or 30 gigs um this will will get it down to a much more reasonable file size while still maintaining really high quality so Nice. It's something I use a lot. Cool. Well, we got an email from Austin who wants to know how we deal with clients not paying you. Presumably, he's having this problem right now. So he's wondering, how can you avoid this in the first place? And what do you do if you get yourself into a situation where a client is withholding money from you? Oh, well, I've been there. I'm guessing you have, too. Um, I yeah, actually don't I doing... know if I've ever had this problem. I know that you have. I've had I've had it many times. When I was doing wedding videos, it was uh, um, it, it happened more than once. I'll say, what I eventually did was I moved to a contract that defined I needed at least half the money up front um, before I would you know go shoot the day. That way, uh, you know, if they stiffed me after that, <laughs> I at least had gotten something to cover some of my costs. Um, and yeah. then I don't I wouldn't deliver final. 
uh, video files or DVDs until uh, full payment had been received. And we've talked right. about it on other episodes where I'd had people who would go, you know, they paid me my first half and then they went dark on me and like years <laughs> later came back and said, oh, I'm so sorry. And I just said, hey, I've still got it. If you pay me what you owe, then you can have it. And, and they've done that. So yeah. uh, you want a contract. You want a contract to specify when things are due. You want to maintain copyright until, uh, you know, full payment's been rendered. And, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, and I think that's pretty common among wedding. I mean, it's been a while since I've done wedding videos, but it seems like it's pretty common to ask for half up front, at the very least, a deposit to hold the date. Yep. Um, and I'm sure some wedding videographers probably ask for full payment, like, on the day of or before the wedding even begins. Uh, but I think you and I have always done like just take the second half upon delivery. Yeah, I, I think if I were to get back into freelancing, I would probably be moving towards a you got to pay me before I even start type of thing. You know, once yeah. you have a reputation where people know you're not fly by night, um, I think I think that's more reasonable. And I, of course, will always point out the great talk done by Mike Montero called F U Pay Me which we can mm -hmm. put in the show notes as well because it's a great uh, great little talk about, um, you know, people in the digital arts and how to get paid by your clients and how much a problem it can be sometimes. Yeah. I know that I've been in a privileged position where I haven't had to worry about that too much. I think ever since I got out of, like, wedding videos, that's primarily where I'd be worried about that. But uh, as I've moved into kind of, like, corporate video clients, I'm just not in a place anymore where I am worried about like this major multinational insurance company, like they're going to pay me. Um, so actually I, I feel like I've built trust with my clients where I trust them so much that I'm like, Oh, I'll invoice you like a month after the project's done. Like, don't even worry about it. Um, so I, I kind of have, I'm kind of completely on the opposite end of the spectrum of like, I have so I have too much trust in my clients that I'm not, forcing them to to sign contracts which um, as always we should say we're not lawyers like <laughs> i'm sure someone's like what do you mean you're not having these giant companies sign contracts for you you don't do any contracts well the way it usually works in my world is they want a proposal so i'll send them like what looks like an invoice but says like this is what it will cost they yeah. sign off on it internally and they say, yeah, I mean, there's a paper trail. There's emails that say, yeah, we're going to have you do this. So I suppose there's some evidence. Um, but then usually when the project's done, I just send them an invoice. And I mean, they already have me like in their payroll system as like a vendor. And they already have my W9 and all of that. So once I send them an invoice, I get payment within 30 days, like or whatever their their payroll rules are. Um, so that's, I mean, that's the thing. It's like, it's never been a problem. So I just continue to do projects with these people and continue to send yeah. invoices to them and it always works. So, I mean, it, it takes trust on both ends. You, you, sure. you do some work with them for a little bit and you, I guess I'm lucky that I kind of work with the same clients over and over, which helps. Right. I, that's what I was just going to say. I was, if you were working with different clients every month, I'm sure the, the odds of you running into some trouble getting paid, uh, would yeah. go up. So. I think it's very worthwhile to uh, have a contract in place that, you know, clearly defines both sides' responsibilities. Yeah, and understanding the kind of client you're working with. Like, if you're working with a startup company, they may have money trouble at some point. So you probably want to get in writing or get some payment up front, um, that sort of thing. All right, looks like we have one final question. Yeah, do you want to read it, Griffin? It says that uh, that Nick, it's a question from Nick. Is that you? That's me. <laughs> Nick writes, I'd like to make more short tutorial videos. Do you have any ideas? How do I increase my video cadence? You're looking for ideas for videos or ideas for so how? So here, I can, every once in a while, somebody pops into one of my videos, uh, usually the hard drive shucking one, but I get a lot of kudos for just how short and to the point it is i guess yeah. a lot of videos are are not like that on youtube and so I, I kind of enjoy that that feels like a little niche that i could maybe explore more and i feel like there's a lot of technology stuff that i do like when i made that uh, youtube dl quick tutorial that i sent to you like 
why don't I should pop one of those out every week? I feel like, but I just I don't quite know. Like, how do you come up with ideas? How do you organize them? How do you decide what to do? I don't know. It was just rolling around in my head, and I decided I would ask you about it. Yeah. Well, it's one of the reasons I made we started doing the podcast years ago was that I was I felt like I was slowing down my cadence uh, yeah. because I was getting so busy with work and travel that it was hard for me to come out with these one-off videos. And I still miss that. Like, the podcast, I like this format, but it's not... It doesn't achieve the goal of like that really short hard drive shocking video. Everyone loves it because it's so short. Um, right. And so I'm kind of doing the opposite of that with the podcast. But I think I think doing, I think that that's a perfect video because it's like you learned this really niche thing. I think anytime you teach yourself a really niche skill and you just you've you've become an expert in it because you you kept doing it over and over again in your personal life shucking those those particular hard drives right um that that's like the perfect kind of topic so i think anytime you come across like oh wow i just taught myself this thing for work to teach clients uh i'm an expert in this now and i probably could explain it in only two minutes those are always good topics all right. Well, I just got to keep my eyes open. I think my my guess is I could find opportunities to create quite a few more videos than I than I currently do, and I'd like to make more. I feel like I come across those kinds of topics all the time, and then I just don't have time to make the videos. Like, right? I th- I think I was like setting up my new Apple Watch, and I was thinking like, I'm a runner using this watch in a very specific way for my runs, and I the way I'm setting up the metrics for the running, like. These, I, I was learning some important things about how to use this watch, and I just thought, yeah, I, I, I could make a really short, like, here's the best setup for your watch for a runner. Uh, someone, I'm sure it would do well. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I would love comments if anybody has any ideas for for things we've talked about. What do they about. want Maybe to hear that would make, yeah, more from yeah, Nick? Yeah, what, what, what would be a good... I mean, obviously, I'm focused on technology and the intersection of technology and, and videography. Um, so let's think. If you guys have any great ideas, let me know, and I will steal them. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so the, um, the moral of this episode is I want you to send me your money to buy my stuff and we want and I want you to send you. me your ideas so I can steal <laughs> send them. all your intellectual property to Nick and all your monetary property to me that's what having a <laughs> podcast is for right <laughs> harvesting <laughs> <laughs> well I think we should wrap it up with that what do you say yeah that's all we need to do today now that we've done our harvest indeed It was a pleasure talking to you. We'll talk to you all later. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. For some reason, I was really paranoid this episode that I was not recording. I was, like, always checking. uh, Oh, no. (laughs) We're 20 minutes in. I probably didn't push record. (laughs) 